So let's go ahead and dive in. My name is Jim Havens. I uh, began in sidewalk ministry over 16 years ago. And, um, you know, I come at this with really a heart that is for evangelization. Um, I love Jesus and I want to follow him. And uh, that's what led me into doing sidewalk ministry, stepping out in faith on sidewalks outside of abortion centers in prayer and in loving outreach. Um, and, um, you know, that's really where I'm where I'm coming from. It's an act of love and I see it as a living out of the gospel. Um, really, uh, uh, specifically Matthew 25, um, talking about loving the least of these. Whatever we do to the least of these, we do it unto, unto Jesus. And also um, the parable of the Good Samaritan that we can't ignore. Our neighbors in need, we have to see them and we have to love them, will their good. And um, also think about the golden rule. If I was, if that was me, what would I want someone to do for me? So I think about that um, in terms of everybody that is involved in. Um, in abortion in our day. Um, so um, I've served various Catholic parishes, schools, organizations, and um, about four years ago, I uh, decided to uh, apply myself to more pro-life activity, to get more intentional, to dive in um, further, really kind of seeing in the different um, parishes and schools and organizations that I was serving in, um, a lot of good work being done, but could see that the pro-life activity was getting lost in the shuffle it just didn't have a very high priority and therefore um, not seeing a lot happening and so i started asking questions about that and, and finding out that um you know i got to start with myself it, it ended up that way that uh, i got to look at myself and and think about what is my own responsibility what is my own call in this so i dove into doing a pro-life radio show called level and abortion about four years ago and um and then that was kind of helping me to educate myself more and more, and then got involved again on the sidewalk um, in Rochester, New York, where I was living at the time. So um, in that time in Rochester, we trained up um, about 200, more than 200 people. Um, did a lot of, the Lord did a lot of good there, met a lot of amazing people in Rochester in, in the years there. And um, uh, we called our, our little organization there, Rock, short for Rochester, uh, love will end abortion, and um, and they're still going strong um, with co-directors Lorraine White and Ellen Duncan. Some of you on this webinar may be from Rochester, so welcome. Um, others may be from all over the country. I know we had I think about 85 people registered tonight, and I saw folks in Los Angeles, folks in um, Massachusetts, and and all kinds of places in between. A few people even up in Canada. Um, so I. I my, my vision for this tonight is simply, I'm just happy to share um, what I've learned um, by God's grace over the last 16 years as I've been in, involved in sidewalk ministry, and really the last four years very intentionally. And um, I've been on the sidewalk every single week for, um, for at least a few hours, um, for a few years now, uh, faithfully in Rochester, and now I'm living down in Southwest, um, Southwest Florida. Um, Fort Myers, Planned Parenthood is where I'm doing um, ministry at this time on a weekly basis. So um, there's a question box. If you want to ask questions at any point, feel free to type them in there and we'll get to them at the end. But maybe I can even um, look over periodically. And if I see something, I might be able to answer it as we go. So feel free to, to put in any questions, any comments in there. And I um, uh, also want to let you know that this is the basic training. It's going to be just a good um, basic primer on kind of what's essential to really help us to understand what this is all about and hopefully to get us inspired and fired up to actually go out and get to the sidewalk as soon as possible. But we are going to start doing some advanced trainings um, that will um, maybe be monthly, I I'm thinking, and that's going to start actually in two weeks from today, August 27th, we've got our first advanced training scheduled where we're hoping to dive deeper on various topics and it would be different each time and also have more of a, a Q&A, more of an open forum for those. So that's kind of going to be ongoing, a little community that we can continue um, to, to learn from one another in. Uh, I don't claim to be an expert in this by any means. I have a lot of experience. I know a lot um, from that experience and from many things that I've learned, but there's always more to learn. I, I feel like I'm still very much a beginner in, in many ways, And um, but I do share with you uh, tonight what I what I've come to understand. and um, But I do hope in those advanced trainings, I, I can perhaps learn 
uh, more from, from folks that have been out there, even if you're going out there just now for the first time and then you're going into those advanced trainings. Um, with your fresh eyes, the things you're experiencing, I think you're going to have a lot probably to share and to teach um, others as well pretty quickly into that. Um, so let us begin with a, with a little prayer here as we dive into the vision for sidewalk ministry. So um, let's remember um, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, verse 22. If your eye is sound, your whole body will be filled with light. Um, so Lord Jesus, help us to see. Uh, come Holy Spirit, help us to really see um, the reality of, of where we are, what's going on. Help us to be faithful to your good promptings and help us to hear your call and to say yes. Um, let's go to Psalm 51, uh, verses 19, I'm sorry, verses 11 through 19. And, um, and let's pray that. It, it says this, turn away your face from our sins, blot out all of our guilt, clean hearts, Create for us, God. Renew in us steadfast spirits. Do not drive us from your presence or take uh, from us your Holy Spirit. Restore our joy in your salvation. Sustain in us a willing spirit. We will teach the wicked your ways that sinners may return to you. Rescue us from death. God, our saving God that our tongues may praise your healing power. Lord, open our lips, that our mouths will proclaim your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, a burnt offering you would not accept. Our sacrifice, God, is a broken spirit. Humble and contrite hearts, God, you will not spurn. A humble and contrite heart, God, you will not spurn. So we praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, we ask you to guide this time together. Help us to just receive whatever goodness you have for us and to be faithful uh, to your call, to your promptings. Come Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so let's dive right into the reality of what we're talking about. Let's get, um, let's get right into it because, again, we've got to see things clearly to respond to things rightly. So let's see it clearly. What, what is going on right now? Well, it is a fact, right? It's a scientific fact that human life begins at conception fertilization. At that first moment, right, when, um, when, the, when the sperm and the egg meet, right, a new creation begins when that takes place, um, when that first cell division takes place, we have a new human being. It's a, it's a unique um, human DNA. All right, not the father's DNA, not the mother's DNA, a unique um, human DNA right there. And, um, and also all that is needed for that human being to continue to grow and become a baby that is born, um, all that is needed is time and nutrition. Um, and, and if nothing um, complicates things, the natural course is for um, the human development to take place from that very first, um, that very first zygote is the scientific medical term. And this is just a term to say a, a human being at the very earliest stage of being, right? And then you can use the term fetus if you want. That's just Latin for little one as, the, as this little one grows in the womb. Um, and then you can, um, once that child is born, well, you could say zygote, embryo, fetus, and then the child is born. Now the term starts to sound more like a, a child, like we're used to acknowledging as a child, right? A newborn, a toddler, um, and then an adolescent, um, you know, a, a teenager, um, an adult, um, an elderly person, perhaps. So these are just terms for human beings on, on different stages of human development, right? But we know as a scientific fact, human life begins um, at conception fertilization. Right, conception fertilization, and I say fertilization because the medical industry has unfortunately um, been deceptive in their language, and they now define pregnancy as implantation. So they say from the time of um, conception fertilization to the time of impl implantation, they don't recognize human life, which is just scientifically false. Um, so you can get into embryology and discover all this, but this is not theological, right? This is scientific. This is a new human being from conception fertilization. Now, philosophically, people can say, 
well, wait a minute, hold on, hold on. That's not a human person, right? Because a human person has to have certain characteristics and that human being doesn't have characteristics like this yet, so they're not a human person. These are really just philosophical games. The fact is, is that every human being is a human person, right? And, and so once we start trying to say, well, there are some human beings who are not human persons, well, that becomes a very, very bad idea because then we start to discriminate and say, well, these human beings are not human persons and therefore we can do what we want with them. It's not true, right? All human beings are human persons and that means all human beings are equal in value, right? What, otherwise you can say, well, when does um, this human person begin? We can get into all these philosophical things, but um, the bottom line is this, is that we know that human life begins at conception fertilization. It's a scientific fact. And um, if anybody wants to play games about philosophy, it's silly. We can break it down so even a child can understand it and just break through all that nonsense and simply say this, when did I start? When did I come into being? The fact is, is that I came into being at conception, fertilization, and then I grew over time from there. I began at conception, fertilization. And if somebody would have killed me before implantation, I wouldn't be here. If somebody would have killed me um, some other time after implantation, um, in the first trimester, second trimester, third trimester, I wouldn't be here. If someone would have killed me as a teenager, I wouldn't be here. So, you know, we just don't want to get into the games, we can break it down real simply. This is not a complicated um, thing. Now, our faith does help us in this area. The Catholic Church lays it out extremely clearly, and the Catholic Church says it this way, right? Human life must be, this is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2270, which if you're not Catholic, this is really just a summary of the faith, um, of the Catholic faith in what um, is proposed for our belief. It says this, human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception, meaning fertilization, from the first moment of his existence, a human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person, among which is the inviolable right of every innocent human being to life. So that's very, very clear, right? So if you're Catholic, you really have no excuse, right? We understand what's going on when we're talking about abortion. It's killing a human being. That's what it is, right? Um, it's, a, it's a direct, a, a direct intentional killing of the human being, the human person in the womb. Um, for other Christians, you can know this also, right, without the catechism, right? Again, reading the Gospels, it's pretty clear um, what Jesus is talking about and talking about the least of these when we apply it to the scientific facts that we know about the child in the womb and what abortion is and all of that. So, um, but, um, but the Catholic Church makes it crystal clear. It doesn't mean that every Catholic leader lives that very well. They, they often don't. They're often very unfaithful to that. And we all are to some degree. We're all desensitized to this to some degree. And the fact is, 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 is there any one of us that is really living like real people are being killed every day? Like 3,000 children are being killed every single day, right? Are we really living like that's happening, right? Are, are we people of integrity or are we hypocrites? Like these are good questions to examine and to ask ourselves. And then it gets into, okay, well, what can we do about it? And that's what we're going to drill down into. But if we don't understand the problem, if we don't look the problem in the eye, then it's going to be really easy for us to make excuses or see things not quite right. And then we're never going to show up on that sidewalk or we're not going to persevere for very long. So we need to see it for what it is if we're going to rightly respond. That's why I'm taking some time on this tonight. Um, and, and I'll also say this, understand this, that there are Christian communities that call themselves Christian that are actually in their doctrine. They've taken a pro-abortion stance. I'll mention one of them. It's called the United Church of Christ. Very sad that they're using the name of Christ. And then they're, they're actually advocating for abortion. There's one million members of this Christian group, this Christian group in the United States. Um, over 5,000 communities of United Church of Christ, and yet, again, explicitly in their doctrine, they are pro-abortion. Um, so we have to understand what's really going on in our communities. I talked to somebody who was part of United Church of Christ, was sitting in the pews there for decades, and they didn't know that that was the stance of the community that they were in. You could just go right to the website, it says that, 
some of the local um, the, the local communities maybe weren't, weren't as vocal about it as, as some of the other ones, but it was there on the national website exactly where they stand. It's hard to believe that somebody could be sitting in the, in the pews for decades and not know that. Um, but here's the fact is that we ought to be sitting in the pews of our churches knowing that our leaders and our churches are very strongly taking a stance on behalf of um, the children in the womb, on behalf of the pregnant moms in need that are being exploited by the thousands every day by the lie of abortion. And we ought to pray for our leaders that they ought to have uh, the kind of hearts um, for the Lord and for the least of these, to love Jesus in the least of these as he calls us to, that they actually want to lead us out to go and love our neighbors in need. Um, so these are, are good things for us to consider, but there's a human responsibility for all of us, right? You don't even have to be religious to even get this necessarily, just in understanding like it's not good to kill each other, right? It's not good um, to, to murder each other, right? We can understand that without even bringing faith into it. Um, so somebody doesn't really have to be a person of faith to be able to grasp the human responsibility to actually love one another and to seek the good for one another. Now, our faith does come in to it pretty quickly, though, because, um, well, we, we, can, we can, again, play games about our human responsibility if we um, degrade the value of certain human lives. And if not for God, and if not for his revelation to us in scripture, um, telling us that every human being is made in the image and likeness of God, every human life is sacred. Without that being clear to us in that way, um, we could get very, very confused and think, well, some human lives are worth less than other human lives. And in a time where abortion is so normalized and baked into our culture, it might be very easy for us to just go along with it and think it's not any big deal. And like, yeah, they're less valuable than us because they're smaller or we don't see them or whatever game we're going to play mentally so that we don't have to deal with this. Um, so you can understand how people who don't have faith can get into some um, trouble on this and can get upside down on this really quick, but there ought to be no excuse for anybody with faith. When we go to the parable of the Good Samaritan, we've got to see our neighbors in need. When we go to the judgment of nations in Matthew 25, we've got to love the least of these and everything that it talks about there, giving drink to the thirsty, visiting uh, the prisoner in, in prison, right? Um, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, everything there depends upon the right to life. It's presupposed in that scripture um, that we are valuing and upholding the dignity of one another at the basic foundational level of the right to life. So if we love Jesus, we've got to love the least of these. He didn't make it optional for us. He made it very, very clear there, identifying himself with the least of these. If you love me, you love them. And he makes it so strong to us to say, you're going to be judged on this. I'm going to say, depart from me, those who didn't serve the least of these. And I'm going to say, welcome into the kingdom, those who did. Right now, that ought not to, I guess, scare us into action. But if it does, if that's what we need, if we need kind of the, uh, uh, the, the we're having the heart attack, we need those uh, paddles put on us to kind of revive us and get us going, then so be it. Let that be the paddles that revive us and get us going. But really, what we ought to be running forward on here is love. We ought to love Jesus, right? And we ought to love him so much that when he tells us the way you love the least of these, you're doing it unto me, you're loving me in them. Well, then we ought to be running out to love them out of love for him, right? And good things are going to happen in that. Trust the Lord, follow his word, do that good. And you're going to see things open up for you in your life that are going to amaze you. I'm not saying this is going to be easy. We'll get into some of that and in the, in the sacrifice involved, but I'm, gonna, I'm saying it's going to be very, very good. It will bring you closer to the Lord than you've ever been if you really dive in with a heart of faith and in a, with a heart of love. Um, so Jesus wants to share his life with us and he wants to share his mission with us. He's not just pouring out his gift of life to us and saying, now go kick back, right? Now go retire and just play golf every day. No, it doesn't work like that. That's not the Christian life. He shares his life with us and his great gift to us. And then we gotta be grateful for it and say, thank you, Lord. Now I'm gonna live out this gratitude and going to share your mission to go bring your love to others. So I'm gonna get busy doing that. I'm going to get busy answering your call to go love my neighbor in need and specifically the least of these. And when we're living in this time where we've got 3,000 children being killed every day by abortion, we've got 3,000 pregnant moms in need who are being exploited by the lie of abortion 
and being um, severely taken advantage of, right? And, and for profit by these abortion centers. Um, we got to get involved in this. We got to see our neighbor in need. And we got to love enough to do something. So let's talk about what we can do. And uh, let me spend five minutes on strategy here. So um, I think hopefully uh, we can say, here I am, Lord, send me. Here I am, Lord, send me. Let's get to the personal responsibility first and say, all right, Lord, I'm willing, I'm open. What can I do? That's a great place to begin, right? Now, um, I think strategy-wise, you want to think about, okay, how do we extend ourselves as a community, right? We want to, we want to take personal responsibility, but then we also don't want to fall into some individualism where it's like, all right, it's just me. Here I go. No, it's a community of people. So who can I get together with in my community and say, let's go? So who can I go with? Now, if I can't find anybody, it's no excuse for me not to start moving forward by myself, but I need to always be moving forward looking for who can I bring in on this with me, right? Who can I share this vision with? And uh, just maybe pray with Matthew 25 and, and just pray with them and say, how, how can we get involved? Let me tell you about something that I'm thinking about and share what we can do with sidewalk ministry. Here's the vision. If we can extend our community, if we can really get things going, the, 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 the vision is, look, there ought to never be an empty sidewalk outside of these abortion centers in our communities any single hour that they are open. There ought to be Christians in prayer. The church ought to be extended in love on those sidewalks every single hour they're open. We know where they are. We know what's going on. Isn't it like the least we can do to be present in prayer? And then to also have some element of loving outreach, which is what we're going to really get into tonight. But we need people to show up, right? So here I am, Lord. Are we willing to show up? Are we willing to show up as a community? Right now, it's not happening. Right now, it's a rare community where the sidewalk is, is going to be filled up every single hour they're open, right? I know in Rochester, New York, you guys are doing really awesome, right? The, the downtown Planned Parenthood, um, most of the hours are filled, right? And so there are people out there in abundance, but not all the hours are filled, right? In the second location in Rochester, the Planned Parenthood in Greece, New York, um, you know, still need a lot of people out there. I know you're trying to get into a third location in Rochester. So if you're on this, in Rochester tonight, you are needed. But if you're on this anywhere tonight, you are needed. There may be groups already gathering and doing some sidewalk ministry, which is good. Um, but I think the main thing is to understand that it's the it's a very rare place that's going to be have their sidewalks completely built out every single hour. The abortion center is open. In fact, um, I don't think I'm aware of one place anywhere that has it every single hour. The abortion center is open. Um, and let me just say why that's so difficult to achieve, sadly. It's because of, of the enemies we've got up against us, the world, the flesh, and the devil. All of those things are really big time against us in this. The world totally against what we're trying to do here. They're going to try to say, what are you doing? You must be crazy going out there. They don't see it as love of neighbor, right? They're all mixed up upside down on abortion. So they're going to throw all that stuff at us. The world's against us on this. For us to stand up and to go love our neighbor in this way, um, yeah, it, it makes us stick out, and we're going to be we're going to face some persecution in that for sure. Um, the flesh, well, we don't feel like doing it. Okay, so that's let's just put that out on the table and bring it to the light. We don't feel like doing it. Look, I've been doing it a long time. Sometimes, uh, and this is growing in me a sense of virtue. I hope that is like out of love of our Lord. Sometimes I really am longing to go. And I'm like, I can't wait to get out there and really love my neighbor in need. I can't wait to be there for them when nobody else is there for them. I can't wait to love the Lord there, right? Um, but oftentimes, oftentimes, I don't want to go at all. I'm dreading it. I'm like, oh, I got to go out there again, you know? But hopefully that conversion of heart can continue to take place. I'm probably never going to be perfect in that area, but maybe by God's grace, I will be. I hope I would be someday. Um, but it's going to be an obstacle for me to overcome my own sinful, selfish inclinations about not wanting to go out there. But if I'm aware of it, if I can bring it to the light, then I can continue to move forward and show up anyway. Right? We can win these battles by God's grace, but we got to know the enemies we've got up against us. And then we've got the devil. Right? He's real. This is his crown jewel. Right? He's killing human beings, and he's and he's bringing uh, women into despair by the thousands every day through this. Um, so he's taking human life and he's, um, and he's taking souls. 
through this, right? And so we've got to come and we've got to bring the, the, the light into the darkness, right? He doesn't want us there. But remember that scripture, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. This is us. The gates of hell are not the devil banging on the gates of heaven or something, trying to get in. And, and No, we're on the offense. The gates of hell, that means we're on the offense, going to the gates of hell. And we're the ones on the offense there bringing the light into the darkness. That's what we're doing in our day on these sidewalks in love, right? And so we're bringing the love of Christ, the light of Christ, on offense to the gates of hell. The devil doesn't want us there. We've got to overcome the spiritual battles as well to get there. So we've got to be prayerful. We've got to dive into a life of holy, holiness like never before. You know how to do it if you're on this, probably. Draw close to Jesus. Draw close to him in the scriptures. If you're Catholic, be praying that rosary, right? Be getting to mass. Be going to confession. Like all the things we know, morning prayer, evening prayer, um, trying to practice the presence of God, pray without ceasing, dive in with everything to that prayer life, that union with Christ, right? And, and now let's go live it out, right? In our vocations, if you're a husband and father, if you're a wife and mother, if you're a priest, if you're a bishop, whatever you are, dive in and love and serve those that are, you are most responsible for um, by virtue of your vocation, by the responsibilities of your vocation. If you're, we're diving into holiness more, then hopefully that's spilling over. We're living our vocations better than ever. Now, let's not remember, let's also remember that third piece of our identity, sharing in the mission of Christ that goes out to love our neighbors and need that apostolic work. And let's do it. Look, this is in accordance with our call to holiness, right? This is living out the life of Christ and bringing it out and sharing in his mission. And it's in accordance with our vocations. Um, when our children, when our spouse sees us engaged in this, that is a good witness for them. Right? That is going to help them to break through their desensitization on this and for them to step out and love their neighbor in need as well. So it actually complements our vocations quite well. If you're a priest and bishop and you're getting involved in this, man, that's complementing your vocation in a very beautiful and powerful way. So many lay people will follow you out there if you're doing that. Or if you're a, a, a Protestant a believer, a Protestant pastor, uh, lead your flock out there. Right, It's part of your vocation. It complements it really, really well. It's bringing your discipleship in Christ alive in a way that really matters. And it's a witness to the world that's actually going to lead people to the kingdom of God. Why are those people out there? What are they doing out there? Oh, those are Christians? Oh, they're there out of love, right? If we get our message across, we could be a great witness to the world in this area as well. <clears throat> okay, so um, a little bit more on the strategy. So every hour they're open year round, right? This is not 40 days for life, that's good, but this is 365 days for life, okay? Every single hour they're open year round. We can do it by God's grace. We've got to say, here I am, Lord, be willing to dive in and be trying to gather people around us. If there's already organizations going, um, already little groups that are gathered on the sidewalk, that's great. Get out there. Um, find out who they are, go at different times, see who's already out there, meet them. It's great meeting people out there, usually some really awesome people you're going to come into contact with out there, and then figure out where the Lord's calling you to fit in, right? Maybe there's already somebody scheduling people, and there's already a schedule, and you can kind of just plug into that schedule. That's what's going on in Rochester, so that's really easy to plug in there. In most places, there probably isn't a schedule, or if there is, um, maybe it's, you know, it's minimal. Uh, maybe it's a little bit more. I, I don't know. But find out who the schedule person is. Find out what, what times are open. See if maybe you can help in the scheduling if they need a little bit of help. Um, whatever it may be. If, and if nobody's doing a schedule, maybe that's something you want to maybe consider down the road, being someone who can help to either find somebody who can take on that role or maybe being able to take on that role yourself. And that's something we can do in advanced training on, how you can actually do the schedule. What's the software? How do you actually do it? because um, we've done all that in Rochester, and we've got some great stuff on that. Um, okay, so um, the idea is sidewalk teams. You don't want to be out there by yourself, so at least two or three, you want to team up with somebody. So grab a friend and get out there, and um, one person's going to be focused on the prayer. You can call that person a, a prayer partner if you want, or whatever you want to say, a prayer warrior, whatever it is, and then one person's going to be focused on the outreach. So one person in prayer, one person in outreach. The person in prayer usually is going to hold some, this is what I recommend, some sort of sign of public witness so that the cars going by know what you're all about, right? And um, this is the one that I normally use. It's just the love will end abortion sign. 
And I use that because I think it's a great message for people that are going by. It makes them think no matter where they're at on the on the pro-life, pro-abortion spectrum, even if they're the most hardened pro-abortion person, they probably believe in love and think love is a good thing. So if they see love will end abortion, that might make them think about it for a second, right? What do I think love is? It might get them into a deeper space, interrupt whatever pattern's going on in there. Who knows? But the Lord will use it if we show up in, with, with faith and love, um, if we've got a, you know, whatever message we've got, but try to find a good message for that person who's praying out there to give a good message to those folks driving by. So that's really what the prayer person, I would say, is focused on is, this is what I've seen work well, to the people driving by. And then also um, certainly praying as people are going in and out specifically for them as they see them going in and out. But then the outreach person, right? You can call this a sidewalk counselor, um, sidewalk advocate, sidewalk um, servant, whatever you wanna call it. Sidewalk counselor is the traditional term. And so this person, I would say, does hold a sign when people are approaching. And it's a sign that's directed to the women. Something like this is what I use, is um, you are not alone, we are here to help you. And that's just a sign so that they can see us kind of from further away and understand just the posture that we're in. We're on their side, we're here to help them. Now, as the car approaches, I will quickly sort of put that sign down as they approach, if I'm being focused, which is a hard part of it, for the sidewalk outreach person to stay focused on the sidewalk, not engaging too much in conversation, but trying to stay focused because you want, when you see somebody who's pulling in, you want to be ready to be approaching them as they're pulling in. If there's no buffer zone out there and you're able to access the full sidewalk, you'll know if there is a buffer zone, there'll be some lines painted on. I would, if you go out there, I would just act as if there's not a buffer zone unless somebody tells you there is. And then even then, maybe I would ask for the documentation on that or, or the legal statute on that or whatever it is. And, um, and then to even research that, you can contact me if you have any more questions on that. But, um, but act as if there's no buffer zone unless somebody tells you there is and, you're, and you know that there is. But no buffer zone means you have access to that sidewalk all the way through that driveway as long as you're not blocking any traffic. So as they're pulling in, you can start to walk in with your pamphlet and say, hey, can, you, can, you, can I give you something? And they might stop right there. If you do a, if you do a good job, they, they probably will sometimes stop there, take your literature, and you can maybe even have a quick conversation asking to move on. That's kind of an advanced technique. We can talk about that some in the advanced training. Maybe it's too much for the basic training, but just want to let you know that's kind of the, the way that it would work. But then they would pull in, and I'll tell you about how it goes from there in just a minute. But just so you understand strategy, that's what we're looking at. One prayer person, at least one prayer person, at least one um, outreach person, one sidewalk counselor. It's great to maybe have a third person there too. I like having three where two or three are gathered, right? Um, but uh, if you start to have more than that, and there are open sidewalk slots at other times, it might be good to split up and cover more ground on the sidewalk, something to think about. Uh, strategy also, this is really, really great for folks who are retired, people, students, um, people who have flexible schedules throughout the week, so they can do at least an hour a week. Also, folks that work nine to five, it doesn't mean that you can't get out there. You can go before work, you can go after work, for example, in Rochester, New York, at the Planned Parenthood downtown, on Tuesdays, they're open till 7 p.m. So if you're working nine to five, you could hit, you could go, you could have a little ministry six to seven p.m. or five to six p.m. And that's gonna be more of a ministry towards the workers as they're coming out. We can talk about that in a moment, but we're here even for them as well, in love for them, praying for their conversion of heart. And, um, and it's important to have people there again, every hour, even those last couple hours they're open to be able to be there in love for those workers. Um, if I was one of those workers, I certainly would want somebody on the sidewalk reaching out to me in love, even if I didn't want them to. Uh, I wish that they would be there. If I was in my right mind, I would want them there trying to trying to help me, trying to bring me to my senses and, and just loving me and praying for me, even if I was um, really staunch in my, in my pro-abortion views and, and didn't seem to be going anywhere. At least that prayer over time could maybe break down some walls. So um, so again, golden rule, whatever we would do, um, whatever we would want for us, we, we ought to do it for others. And in this realm, it's very powerful to love our neighbors in that way, our, our lost neighbors in need. Again, we know where they are in these abortion centers. They're working in there and, and they could really use someone praying for them and reaching out for them. So that would be an important shift to be there. 
if you could do an hour after work, even if you're working a nine to five, or I know that downtown Planned Parenthood in Rochester, for example, is open on Thursday mornings beginning at 7.30 a.m., so their hours say. So you could maybe even hit it up an hour before you go to work. So um, if somebody, where there's a will, there's a way. If somebody gets this and they're like, look, I can do an hour a week. I'm catching the vision. I can do my part. Then you're going to be able to find an hour a week to do it. You can commit to it. And then you can show up and persevere. Come back to the advanced trainings. Let's sharpen each other. Encourage one another. Let's dive into this together. Okay, so we can do this where there's a will, there's a way. So come Holy Spirit. Um, let's get into the sidewalk counselor five essentials. This is really meat and potatoes. Let's dive in. Number one thing for sidewalk counseling, we want to come with a disposition of faith and love. I talked about that a little bit already, but our goal is to have a sort of sanctified vision, a holy vision where we're seeing everybody going in and out of that place with eyes of love, the way our Lord would look upon us, right? And so it makes sense to spend some time in prayer before we go Latin the Lord look upon us with those eyes of love that he has, with that gaze of love that he has, to just spend a few minutes with your eyes closed, just imagining the reality, which is real. It's not like you're imagining it like this is not real. I'm just imagining it. It's actually meditating on the reality that is really happening, that um, he's pouring his love out. He's lavishing you in his love. You're soaking in the love of the sacred heart of Jesus and to open your heart and say yes to that right? So let him gaze on you with love, right? And now go take that and go out and now you go pass it on with those eyes of love for others to pray or to reach out, whatever you are called to. If it's your first time getting out on the sidewalk, you just want to show up in prayer and you just want to spend an hour out there in prayer and, um, you know, maybe come back for the advanced training, tell us how it goes or email me, let me know how it goes. But the, again, the main thing from this, if you've never been out there before, just get out there, grab a buddy, grab a friend, get out there and just go pray for an hour. Let me know how it goes. Come back to the advanced training. We'll go from there. Um, if you're in Rochester, you've already got a team of people you can plug in with. Or if you're in another place and you know a team of people you can plug in with, awesome. So, um, but that disposition of faith and love, we want to try to have that sanctified vision. And again, that's going to, if we're starting to get good at that, then that's going to spill over into our families when we go home, into our vocations, um, into our prayer lives and into everything we do. This is a good virtue to be developing. This ministry makes us to get more and more intentional in it because we need to do our very best to have that kind of vision when we go out there. But for the grace of God, go I. We could be in that situation. Um, we could be even the abortionist if things in our lives went different, except for God's grace. So let's go out there in a, in a real work of mercy with eyes of love for them. Um, but number two, most essential, we got to show up. If we don't show up, it doesn't, nothing's happening. The sidewalk is still empty. We've got to show up. Um, so again, show up, right? And, and if you're trying to find, if you're, if you can't find anybody to go with you, invite them to this webinar, get them to come to this webinar, either the basic training, if we do it again, hopefully soon, or even just bring them to the advanced training and just start talking with them, praying with them. And, um, and, and hopefully something will click with somebody that you know, and you can, uh, you can get your own sidewalk team going in a hurry. When we're out there, after we show up, again, our disposition, getting back to the disposition, how are we handling ourselves out there? I think the mindset, the heart disposition we want to keep in mind, we want to be the calm in the storm. Think about Jesus as the calm in the storm. That's what we want to embody. There's a lot of storm going on with people going in and out of there, a lot of storm in their hearts. We want to bring the calm in the storm. We want to let them know that we are on their side and hopefully draw them over to us where we can empower them and help them. And, um, and so the next step is to invite. So, um, so as people are coming in, right, we, they're getting out of their cars and we want to say something, right? It's just human connection. Let's not make it any more complicated than that. How would you connect with anybody that you're just seeing for the first time and you're trying to say hello to them, right? For me, usually it's just, if it's in the morning, hey, good morning, how are you today, right? If it's in the afternoon, hey, good afternoon, how are you today, right? Just basic human connection, how we would connect with anybody, right? We don't want to be super salesy with it. We don't want to have like this memorized script or, or something that we're reading that doesn't come off as natural, right? We just want to make a human connection, a human being trying to connect with another human being, that's it, right? And, and they may be receptive and say, hey, uh, you know, doing good. How about you? Just a common greeting that would take place there. Or they may just totally ignore you, right? And if they totally ignore you, 
then you go to the next thing. Um, well, even if they don't totally ignore you, the next thing that you want to have in your mind is to invite them over to talk with you, right? That's easier to do if they if you've made that human connection. That's easier than to invite them over um, than if you haven't. But even if you haven't made that human connection, you want to still invite them over, maybe a little bit more awkward, but hey, can I talk with you for a minute? I've got some information I'd like to share with you. Usually as simple as that, right, is, is what I usually say. Something as simple as that. Just invite them over to talk with you. Simple, right? Now, they at that time, it's not uncommon that they'll say, okay, and come on over. Or they might have some sort of hesitation that you can ask them again, and they will come over like, um, well, I, I got to get to my appointment, you know? So they're engaging you, but they're trying to give you an excuse. But guess what? That's usually pretty easy to overcome. And you can say, oh, it'll just take a moment. Just come on over. And if it seems like, um, you know, they, they, they're they going to go in anyway, um, or if they ignore you, then that third piece you want to try to get to, if they're not already going to come over, is to just say, at least come over, take the information, right? At least come over, take the information. Now, they may do that. A lot of times, that's not uncommon either, that they would have said no, but then you invited them just that one last time. Well, at least take the information while you're in there, right? Look it over. And um, it's always good to have more information, right? So, um, then they may come over and just take that information. And when they do, you can even ask them again or you know, a question to try to engage and to try to talk to them from there. And oftentimes conversations open up from that, or maybe they will just take it and, and then just go in. But again, the calm in the storm, if they go in, don't panic, pray, right? Don't panic, pray. Understand that a lot of times people do go in and then they end up coming out and really great things happen. So just because they go in doesn't mean all is lost. So stay calm, stay prayerful, and um, and let the Lord do his work. And if you're out there doing the outreach, look for the next person that's coming. There may be a companion with them. Um, you know, and at that point, you may want to try to engage the companion as well. If we have time to get into that, I would love to. But again, I want to be respectful to this one hour window that we have here. So um uh, so anyway, they understand that they've got a certain disposition that they're coming there with. You've got a certain disposition, right? This calm in the storm, this eyes of love that you're trying to reach out with. Well, they've got a certain disposition too. And um, it's usually going to be a um, pretty difficult one. Um, but sometimes it may be a pretty open disposition. And all they need is somebody there where they just see the sign. And that's the sign that they needed. And they keep on driving. Understand that this is why this strategy works. If we always have people out there, because we know there's already statistics that prove it works, um, Planned Parenthood's own statistics that they have reported is that whenever there's somebody in peaceful prayer on the sidewalk outside of one of their abortion clinics, the no-show rate goes to as high as 75% that day. So that means three quarters of the women with appointments just simply don't show up because there's somebody outside praying and probably holding a sign, right? And so they just see that and it triggers something and they just keep going. Right? Normally, their no-show rate's about 25%. It goes as high as 75% if someone's on the sidewalk. So just being there in prayer, I think, with a sign is going to help turn a lot of people away. And you're not going to know about it. They don't stop and tell you about that. Uh, but it matters. It matters. It's saving lives. And it's helping a whole lot of people just to see you out there, right? Just to let the prayer work through you, let the grace flow through you. Um, and also, um, we do know that... Um, um, that we've seen that these places will close when we turn away enough of their business. So we know people are turning away just by seeing us, um, but then people are going to turn away after they talk with us, right? And, and sometimes we get to be a big part of some really dramatic things and we get to walk with the mom and see the child born and it's beautiful and, and a lot of shades in between. Sometimes they may just, it may be a quick interaction and then they just get in their car and leave. And maybe they'll tell us about what happened there, that they were leaving an abortion appointment, or maybe they tell us nothing. Um, and so we just don't always know, but we do know that God is using us there. And we see plenty of evidence to know that this works a lot. And even if it, it, if it worked very minimal, it's still the right thing to do to be there as the hands and feet of Christ, as a light in, a, as in the darkness in these places. But we also happen to know that it's very effective. And, and the more business we turn away there, the more they can't make their budget, and then these places have to close. So this is a strategy to end abortion and minister to as many people as we can along the way. This is a no-brainer, in my opinion. And I think the evidence bears that out. I hope you catch that vision and bring that into your local community and, and make it a mission to say, look, 
we can't have an empty sidewalk here. It's unacceptable. It's unacceptable to have an empty sidewalk. Just heard for, you know, you hear this frequently as well. Somebody, um, I just heard a story from this from Rochester where um, somebody pulled up or they were talking to one of the sidewalk counselors out there and they said, well, I wish you would have been here when I, when I had my abortion here. Nobody was here for me, right? You hear that over and over again. Um, people will stop and they'll say that. And so um, when you spend time outside of these places, it's something that you're going to hear. And all we can say is, I'm sorry, I wish I would have been there. I wish we would have been there for you. But that's why we're out here. We want to be there. We want to be here for people now. And so catch that vision. The, these moms deserve to have somebody there. A lot of times they are receptive and they just don't know where to go. And they just don't even know that there's help available. We're extending the help of those pregnancy help centers in the community to that sidewalk so they know it exists. And then we're pointing the way out of there. Um, so there's a whole lot more that I could say about that specifically, but I want you to understand they have a certain disposition they're walking in with. They may be very receptive and whatever we say clicks and they go. Um, they may be very hardened and not receptive at all. And in a lot of those situations, it doesn't matter what we say. So, you know, we have to be good with rejection in this work as well. A lot of times people are going to ignore us and go in. Maybe they might even have a, a, a rude word occasionally that takes place, uh, but we're going to love them anyway. Right. And so um, and we're going to pray for them anyway. And we're going to hope that, that those walls come down anyway. And um, and sometimes we do. And we see those dramatic things where somebody who seemed very, very upset at us. Uh, in fact, those are the times I think that I've seen the most beautiful things happen when there's a lot of anger to the person I'm reaching out to. And then I've seen amazing dramatic turnarounds because, you know, something's going on in there that they're really struggling with. Right. They're on the fence. Right. And that's why it's coming out in that anger um, when they just ignore you, just straight ignore you and don't say anything to you. That's kind of the hardest time, I think. That, that's kind of the ones where um, it's hard. It's really very, very difficult to reach them. But again, we pray for them and, and we don't know where their story ends up. And, and maybe the witness that we give them of love, um, even when they're leaving, hopefully we've got people on the sidewalk when they're leaving and we can reach out to them with support after abortion cards or some sort of post-abortion healing information we can give to them or just a look of love. I do a pat on the, on the heart and, and uh, you know, I just let them know the thing that I'll say to a mom that's coming out after an abortion is we love you. We love you. If, if you want to pull up, we, we've got some information for you, you know, um, and maybe that prevents the next abortion or maybe that helps her find the Lord in her life. She turns to prayer that night or sometime soon because she, you know, the Lord works through you. We don't know, but it's good that we're there witnessing the Lord's love to her and loving on her in a way that maybe she's never been loved before. Um, okay, so we're running out of time. The last piece, though, that I got to get in is we've got to empower them there. Um, after they come over and talk with us, then we want to identify what's the real problem going on. There is a real problem. That's why they're there. Is it a material problem? Is it a relationship problem? Are they being pressured by their parents? Like, What's happening here? So we want to listen. We want to ask them what's going on and listen to try to figure out what's the real problem going on and help her to see what the real problem is. So we want to, we, we take like this disposition of we are a friend on her side. That's truly who we are. And we want to help her identify the real problem. And then we want to help her to address that real problem with local resources that exist. And if they don't exist, then we try to figure it out for them and, and help them. But we want to empower them to address the real problem going on, but we have to first help them to identify it. And then we, at the same time, we wanna to help to turn the heart back to the child, understanding that abortion is a lie, right? The, the, the baby is not a, the problem, right? This other thing is the problem. If we can help you with that, if you can get um, empowered to take care of that, then we can help you, right? But if you kill the child, which is not the problem at all, right? You're still gonna have this other problem in some way, right? In some degree. And now you've got even a bigger problem. Because now you've got the hurt of abortion, the wound of abortion, and this is a big, big problem that um, you know is not just going to be an easy thing to deal with. Like the lie of abortion is trying to tell you it is; it's a lie, right? So, um, so anyway, we want to empower um, that mom, and I wish I could go through all the different types of things that we use out there and, and who we talk, to, you know, and, and the different people that we talk to. I wish we had time for it, but we're running out of time, and I really want to make sure to get co-director of Rock. Love Will End Abortion in here. Um, that is Lorraine White. I want her to share a little bit um, of personal testimony. And also, um, 
share a little bit um, with the folks in Rochester as well to just let um, you guys know um, about how you can plug in with the Rock Level End Abortion organization there. You guys are blessed because you have um, Lorraine White and Ellen Duncan, the, the other co-director for Rock, Love, uh, Rock Level End Abortion. You've got them um, that are they're already scheduling. They've already got the resources for you. They've already got everything you need. You just need to plug in. Um, so um, Lorraine, can you share a little bit with us now? Sure, absolutely. I say this every time Jim goes through the training. I just get so fired up with all the the passion that he has, and it's much like what it's like to be out on the sidewalk. You can think about this theoretically, and you can think about the atrocity that abortion is, but when you actually overcome your own fear or your own logistics to actually get out on the sidewalk, you encounter Jesus in a way that you can't possibly do in any other way. What do I mean by this? You see the suffering. You see the persecution. We get persecuted out there. We get um, hollered at. We get uh, told we're not doing the right thing. But like Jim said, we love them all the more because there's this pain there. And when they see the kindness and the love that we outpour onto them, it oftentimes just changes them. We had an incident one time at our Greece location, and we were out there in loving witness and loving prayer. And a woman came up, and she zoomed right into the side, right into the parking lot, opened her door, and didn't even close the door to come up to us, and was very angry. I said, "Why are you out here? My daughter had an abortion, and she feels so upset every time that she comes by here." And I said, "I am so sorry." Let me explain why we're out here. We're out here so that people don't feel that pain that your daughter feels every time there's a reminder of the loss that she had. Well, this woman broke down and she said, you mean you're actually out here helping people? I said, yes, we're out here to intercede before they make this choice in their life that they completely diverge from life and from Christ's mercy and his love. And she just broke down and said, can I send my daughter to come talk to you? And we said, yes. And, and I reached in my pocket and I gave her the rosary that I had. I said, give this to her, tell her we're praying for her. And so by being out on the sidewalk, it's not only encountering people um, just before their choice, it's also encountering them wherever they are in their life. And there's been a, a situation that happened just last week where a woman told us how she had been to Planned Parenthood a number of times for contraception, for STD testing, for um, two prior abortions that she felt she was really pressured into. In this time, something clicked with her. Okay, so think about this. Time and time again, she goes in and out and she sees a loving witness on the sidewalk, but she never talks to anybody. Two weeks ago, something stirred in her heart and she talked to one of the sidewalk advocates out there because she saw something kind and loving in this woman and one of the sidewalk advocates. And she said, I just couldn't turn away. I wanted to come talk to her. And now things are diverging to a beautiful place in her life where she's getting the help that she needs. She's going from being homeless and desperate and not wanting to have a third abortion and being pressured into that to having the resources available to her for a home for herself and for her son in a loving environment for a, a home that actually accepts and loves women like this, exactly like this, where they're kind of down and out and they need that help. So what Jim was talking about is having a community of people. And I will say that you're probably thinking, well, what do I say and how do I know the resources? Just get out there, just go out on the sidewalk and pray and allow the Holy Spirit to work within you. That's what we all do. None of us were born knowing how to do this. We were just born with love in our hearts to help somebody else. And so I know that you have questions. I know that you have fears, but I'm more than happy to talk about any of those things that you feel like you have to overcome. Like Jim said, the world, the flesh and the devil are gonna keep you from going out there. But I'll leave you with this. The Lord wants to use the talents that you have. You know what they are. He knows what they are. And he's asking you to go out there and use the talents that you have. And I just want to read real quick a scripture, if I can, about using those talents and about loving the Lord and about not hiding those talents. This is from Matthew 5, 14. You are the light that gives the light to the world. A city that is built on a hill cannot be hidden. And people don't hide a light under a bowl. 
they put it on the lampstand so the light shines for all the people in the house. In the same way, you should be a light to other people. Live so that they will see the good things you do and will praise your Father in heaven. And so just take those words to prayer and your own love for others to prayer and get out on the sidewalk. Um, for those of you in Rochester and others, you'll receive an email from me just inviting you to schedule some time. We can even talk about what else to do um, if you have any questions or concerns or um, thoughts that you'd like to share after the after the webinar. Thank you, Jim, for the opportunity. Awesome. Yeah, thank you, Lorraine. And um, so I just want to encourage folks, if you are in the Rochester, New York area, um, yeah, it's very, you, you guys have a great deal going. You can connect with um, Lorraine, gets, gets scheduled for a time to go come and see, go check it out. And um, you're going to be out there with somebody and you can even shadow like uh, somebody that's been out there a long time and kind of learn through experience, which really is the best way um, to learn is to dive in and learn some from somebody by standing there and, and watching them in action. Um, and if you're not in Rochester, New York, which is um, a bunch of people on this webinar, just dive in, right? Just go out there and, and just pray. Find one other person to go with you. Just go and show up and pray and, um, and just see what happens. Spend an hour out there. Um, email me. Let me know how it goes. Jim Havens at levelendabortion.com. Um, come back to our advanced training webinar in two weeks, and um, and we're gonna we're gonna dive into the resources, and we're gonna we're gonna hopefully continue to just move forward together in this sharpening one another. Um, but one more one more piece I want to share with you, and and this is interesting because um, I didn't know what Lorraine was about to just share about the talents and about the scripture she was gonna share or anything like that, but this perfectly, I think, um, follows up with it very, very well. This is something that convicts me strong to help me to know all the more that our Lord's hand is on all of this, and that um, this is not just for like the select few, right? This is for everybody. This is a matter of Christian identity. Are we disciples of Christ? If we are, he said, you love me in the way you love the least of these. We know that abortion's going on. We know where it's happening. We know that these sidewalks are empty. Let's connect it all together and listen to this scripture, right? The fact that right before that scripture about whatever you do to the least of these, you do it unto me, the judgment of nations at the end of chapter 25. Well, what comes right before that in the gospel of Matthew chapter 25? It's the parable of the talents, right? It's the master giving talents and then coming back and seeing what they did with them, right? I, I have people say to me sometimes, well, it's just a special charism that you have for the sidewalk. Not everybody's called to it. And I'm saying, well, wait a minute, hold on. Um, I, I've spent some time in prayer, kind of trying to discern what the Lord's given me, what the talent is and what it isn't, right? And, and what skills I've got and what I don't have. Um, this is not a special talent for me on the sidewalk. He's given me some talents, just like he's given everybody some talents. And guess what? This is the need in our time. The sidewalks are empty in our local community. Whatever talents you got, whatever skills you got, apply them to your local sidewalk. It's empty. We need to be there. We got to love our neighbors in need. It's that simple. So whatever it is that the Lord's given me, it's me bringing it to the sidewalk and applying it there. So whatever he's given you, bring it to the sidewalk and apply it there right if if this doesn't match up with the parable of the good samaritan where you see the neighbor in need and we're called to engage and not just like go around and forget about it if this doesn't apply to these places these abortion centers in our communities the fact that we just drive by instead of actually filling up the sidewalks with the body of christ if it doesn't apply here then where does the parable of the good samaritan apply it has to apply here right? The church has to be there and it has to begin with us. So here I am, Lord, right? And I'll let, let's look around and try to grab some others and let's get going, right? And, and apply whatever we've got, wherever we are to those abortion centers and, and, and do what we can to get those sidewalks built out. Once those sidewalks are built out, maybe it takes a year or two or, or a few more. By God's grace, I hope it doesn't. I hope it all ends um, today. That'd be awesome as soon as possible. May the Lord end abortion. May we participate with his grace to help that to happen. Um, but if it's going to take a while, so be it. We got to dive in and do the work. And if once these sidewalks are built out, can do we have the luxury then of saying, well, maybe I'm not called to be there. 
anymore. There are other people that have a special calling or a special skill for the sidewalk. Yeah, maybe so, okay? But right now you're needed. The sidewalk is empty. Will you show up? Will you say, here I am, Lord? That's the situation we're in. The house is on fire. Here's the water. Anybody can go and bring a bucket and, or are we just gonna move on and just say, eh, not my problem. I'm not called to help out here, right? I don't think we're allowed to do that, right? Not if we're really Christians, not if we really love our Lord. And so, um, so come Holy Spirit and help us out. Final scripture to end it all off. This is from the end of the gospel of John. And I think this will set us right to close. This is, um, this is Peter after he's already denied the Lord three times. Um, well, there's repentance. Look, um, maybe we've been denying that, uh, that we have a place in any of this for a long time. Look, we're all desensitized to the reality of it. Again, is any of us living like real people by the thousands are being killed every single day in our country? Real children by the thousands are being murdered every single day. Is anybody really living like that's really happening? So this is, a, this is a question of, are we going to be people of integrity or are we going to be hypocrites? Look, we all need to repent on this. We've all denied our Lord on this. So, um, so let us have those humble and contrite hearts on this. And, and, and again, that's going to be something that's going to be over and over again on this because we've got a long way to grow and a long way to go on all of this. But let's dive in and um, let's remember this. When Peter did repent, and he encounters our Lord once again. And hopefully this is where we are tonight at this moment. We're sorry, Lord. Help us to begin again stronger than ever with you. We see it. Here I am, Lord. Help me to dive in by your grace. I can do nothing on my own, but with you, God, all things are possible. And then we hear Jesus speaking to Peter in that encounter. And three times he's asking him, do you love me? Right? To counteract those three times in which he denied him. And, uh, you know, Peter is, yes, yes, I love you. Right? And, um, and this is what he says to him at the end after the feed my sheep, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. He says this, the words of Jesus to us tonight right here. Amen, amen, I say to you. When you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. He said this signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, follow me, follow me. He's telling him, follow me to the cross. Sacrificial love, lay down your life in love. I know you don't want to do this, right? You didn't want to do it the first time, but now you've repented and now you're ready to follow me. I, I say it again, follow me. And I, I just asked you three times, you said you loved me. Will you follow me? You said you loved me, would you follow me? Do we authentically love our Lord? Are we willing to follow him into this area? Jesus who tells us, if you love me, love and serve the least of these, right? And we know what's going on. We know where these places are. I've laid it out for you. Here it is. Here I am, Lord, right? So dive in wherever you are. Get to the sidewalk in prayer, in loving outreach, um, however you want to do it. Uh, you can email me anything you want on ter in terms of feedback. I'd love to hear from you, jimhavens at lovelandabortion.com. We will send this video out again after it as an email if you want to share it with anybody that you might be wanting to come out with you or if you want to um, re-watch it if you missed some of it or whatever. Um, but, uh, but anyway, um, God bless you. I affirm your goodness even in showing up to something like this. So God is at work in you, and I hope you say yes to whatever promptings he has for you. Please pray for me that I would say yes to the promptings he has for me. Um, believe me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling like all of us are to, to just hear the voice of the Lord and say yes. And this is an area that I think we all need to be convicted. He is speaking and he's calling us to action. Will we say yes? So let's, um, let's do it together as we close. Um, Jesus, we love you. We want to follow you. Wherever you're going, we want to be. Um, so help us to have the courage to go to places that maybe we don't want to go um, and help us to have the love um, that really trusts that you have what's best for us and that um, you will really use us um, in your um, by filling us with your life and in using us for your mission um, to reach out to others that need some rescue, that need some restoration, that need some um, some eyes of love upon them and some hands and feet of love that, that are willing to reach out and stand up and be there for them. 
uh, may no, no one go in and out of these abortion centers alone with that empty sidewalk. God, fill these empty sidewalks with your people, the church. I know you're pouring out the grace, God. I know you're not the problem. I know that it's us. I know that, that it's the church. So help us to hear your call. Help us to say yes and to respond with faith that you can really be glorified in us and do the good work uh, that you want to do. We love you and we praise you. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, Blessed Mother Mary, pray for us. All you holy saints and holy angels, pray for us. Amen. God bless you.